Yep, you did. Thank you. And be sure it's on green. The little thing on the side. Oh, no. I'll have to put some. You're going to be reading, right? Okay. I, I think it's working now. <coughs> yep, it works. Okay. Um, Just a second. Unfortunately, I've got a text here, and I'm going to have to um, read this text to you. So we checked the slides, and the slides seem to have enough vibrance, so I, I hope you'll put up with me for, for doing this. I'd like to thank uh, uh, John Vardalis and uh, Larry Ferrero for involving me in this project because it was, um, it was an interesting one for me. Uh, at my university, you know, we're struggling against the fact that, unlike uh, what Professor McClellan said, uh, many of my administrators think that history is not very important, that the least important of the not very important <laughs> history is ancient history. And so I'm glad to hear that I can come back and say, well, at least the history of technology of the ancient history is the most important of the least important part of the least important subject. And if you didn't follow that, then great, I'm in a, in a, a friendly crowd, that's good. Um, as you all know by now, the student project at the core of this symposium was designed around the principle that technology affects the history of those who use it. The idea was to examine a real life problem in naval architecture that stemmed from antiquity and had a definite impact on world history. So when Larry and John approached me about it, I thought it was a really cool idea and uh, told them that I would agree to provide whatever contextual information I could. You also know from listening to Larry that the real life problem we developed for the Stevens students, the introduction of the Cutwater Bow, involved a step in ship development that occurred hundreds of years before triremes or, and I'm going to use the, the, the term, a, num a numerical term for them, threes, uh, before threes became popular. But that's okay, because the marrying of the cutwater bow to the long hull of the <coughs> ward galley is what enabled the two most important aspects of the trireme to be realized, and that is speed and reliability in ramming. Speed, be because the cutwater bow reduced hull resistance, and I suspect it reduces hull resistance in waves and reliability in ramming because the design allowed the ship's bottom timbers, and particularly the main water, la uh, water line whales, which you see port whale indicated on the bottom of the slide, uh, port whale indicated up in the schematic drawing of the timbers uh, in the black area. It allowed these reinforcing members of the side of the vessel to come together into a, a, a matrix of, of interconnecting timbers that um, allowed for uh, the hull of the, of the ship to absorb the impact of, of the ram and blow. Um, and particularly when uh, it was encased inside a bronze ram, which is like a cap, a cap to a tooth, which you see down here, uh, or better yet, uh, a head to a hammer, which you see down here on the, uh, in the lower left of the slide. So I suppose the obvious question is, why threes? Why triremes? The short am answer is simple, and I heard it from the students who I talked to in the back, and that's the trireme trust kindly shared with us, and they're, they're the ones who organized the fundraising to, to uh, realize the trireme. They kindly shared with us the lines of Olympias so that our students didn't have to start from scratch and could focus solely on the bow structure. The trust was able to produce Olympias because we know enough about triremes to make a hypothetical reconstruction possible. And that's something that uh, allowed John uh, Hale to, to make his hypothetical reconstruction. And he gave you an idea of what kind of evidence that we have. These triremes were built over a long span of time, almost a thousand years, and were thus discussed more than any other warship class as this word count from Greek and Latin literature shows. If you just uh, do a, a, a search through um, hypertext database of Greek <coughs> authors and Latin authors, you'll see that threes are mentioned 2,640 times in Greek authors, and that's all various forms of threes, uh, the singular and the plural and all the declined endings. 
fours are mentioned uh, a combined total of 75 times, and fives are mentioned a combined total of 139 times. That's an incredible dif difference, 2,722 times. It was the worship of antiquity. The class was also associated with Athens during her greatest period of cultural excellence, as we learned from John Hale. And authors like Thucydides, himself a trireme commander, provide us with graphic descriptions of how triremes were used in battle and how they enabled Athens to establish, as he told us, a thalassocracy or sea empire. When Renaissance thinkers rediscovered Greece and Rome, again, John touched on this, triremes and how they worked became a fascination for many Europeans, particularly those from states with naval aspirations, like the Venetians, the Genoese, the Dutch, the English, and the French. Even Americans took up this fascination uh, in the late 19th century and 20th centuries when we, as a nation's imperial power, struggled with what kind of nation we wished to be, an expansionist America or an isolationist one. And notice that the fat cat, Uncle Sam, on the left there has got a steamship, gal a steam warship underneath his, his arm. Um, and what we do is we progress through time here. Uh, the Civil War, Uncle Sam is in the center. And then to the right, we get the 1898 one, who, where we're starting to uh, add colonies. And the, the guy on the right, so the, the cartoonist writes, is uh, sought by all nations around the world as their friend because of our power and might. There were others, uh, this cartoon is, is making fun of the others, the others who were saying, and we have this argument today in the United States, that we would be better off, I'm thinking of Rand Paul here, that we would be better off if we just looked inward and not outward and didn't bother ourselves so much with things outside the United States, but paid more attention to ourselves. At this same time, an American naval officer named Alfred Thayer Mahan wrote an influential book titled The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783. And in it, he argued that America could never be a great nation without turning her eyes outward and developing her sea power. He felt that such power grew from societies of free people. Think of the Athenians now. Industrious shopkeepers and manufacturers. Think of the English now who sold their goods abroad in ships under their own flag, which they protected with a robust fleet. The enabling technology for him, for such power, when Mahan published his book in 1890, was the steam-powered warship, which had to be supported by a wide system of friendly overseas bases, the beaches that John Hale talked about, or better yet, colonies, which could provide coal, water, and supplies, and were carefully milked like cows for the benefit of the imperial power. That's exactly a man's terms. For Mahan and others like him, empire was a good thing because it secured commerce, it promoted free exchange of ideas, and it produced prosperity for everybody concerned, both at home and abroad. Except for his belief in commerce as the driving force, Mahan could have been a PR man for Pericles in describing the Athenian Empire of the 5th century BC. For Athens, the enabling technology, as we've learned, was the trireme. According to Pericles, who's their, who was their most famous general and statesman, the opportunities afforded the Athenians by their trireme fleet were limitless, as he told them in a famous speech uh, that is uh, recorded by Thucydides. Here's a quote from it. You perhaps think that your empire extends only over your allies, he told the citizens of Athens when they were dispirited during the first years of the Peloponnesian War with Sparta. I will declare to you the truth, he says. The whole world before our eyes is divided into two parts, land and sea, each of which is valuable and useful to man. Of the whole of one of these parts you are now in control not only of the area at present in your power, but elsewhere too, if you want to go further. With your navy as it is today, there is no power on earth, not even the king of Persia or anybody else, which can stop you from sailing where you wish. Considering the importance of the trireme to Athens in her golden age of culture under Heracles, 
and considering Mahanian concepts of sea power, can't we reasonably conclude that the trireme, a piece of naval technology, was a major force in shaping Mediterranean history? Well, the simple answer to that question is yes. But it's not because Athens beat Persia at Salamis in 480 BC and thus saved the West from Oriental despotism and ensured the continuance of her democracy, which is partly true. And it's not because she forged an empire whose prosperity built the Parthenon and nurtured such artists and intellectuals like Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Herodotus, Thucydides, Socrates, which is also partly true. It was because triremes populated most every fleet of consequence for a thousand years and contributed in countless large and small ways over a very long span of history and wide geographic region. For us to consider and understand the long story of why triremes were so popular, I think we've got to take a methodical approach and consider the matter in three steps. First, we need to review how warships and navies were used prior to the trireme so we can understand the changes brought about by the adoption of the new class. Second, we need to discuss the larger ship classes that were built after triremes were introduced and became popular, and the strategic objectives for which these larger warships were constructed. And finally, we need to consider the trireme in light of the major objectives most fleets were built to achieve, because that will explain to us why triremes remained popular throughout all periods of naval history. So let's follow our three-step process and consider how trireme navies first evolved. To begin with, I want to stress a few basic principles that underlie the development and use of naval power throughout Mediterranean antiquity. First and foremost, and this is number one, navies are expensive. And despite the hype surrounding the Army-Navy game each year, <coughs> navies are of secondary importance to the Army. It's just the way it is. True naval power requires a state to foot the bill for a standing navy of warships whose sole purpose is naval service. And because of the expense, expense involved, most Mediterranean powers tried to find ways to avoid building a standing navy if their objectives could be secured in other ways. And finally, the application of technology can and did make a big difference to naval warfare, it still is, but it is incredibly expensive and thus ephemeral and exposed to budget cuts. With these concepts in mind, let's get started. Up until the sixth century, ancient navies were largely amateur in nature. And by this I mean the ships were gathered from wealthy individuals in an ad hoc manner when the need arose. In other words, throughout the Mediterranean, it seems that ancient states avoided building state-owned fleets and establishing what we might call a standing navy. The reason why is obvious, and it takes us back to the first basic principle. Navies are prohibitively expensive, and most states had not yet developed the kind of institutions to deal with state-owned property of this nature. The ships that were pressed into service were dual-purpose vessels owned by wealthy elites who used them both for raiding and for trading and who provided them to the ruler or state for ad hoc temporary purposes. This model is clearly seen in the ships brought by the Achaean grandees to Troy. Grandees who were persuaded to come join the force, all except for Brad Pitt there, when Agamemnon made the rounds of his guest friends and called on them to bring both ships and men to avenge the dishonor to his family that he had suffered by the abduction of Helen. Although I can't prove it, I bet the same system lay behind these two famous fleets from the Bronze Age. The 17th century BC Theron flotilla, shown on the top uh, panel, a wall painting from the so-called West House at Thera, an island just north of Crete, and the monumental depiction of the Sea People's Fleet on the 12th century BC mortuary temple of Ramses III at a place called Medina Habu in, near Luxor in Egypt. Such oared ships, or galleys, 
still carried no rams at their prows. We have long suspected that these projections, the ones that we see, were for hydrodynamic reasons. And now, I think, at least to my satisfaction, the Stevens students have affirmed that view, as I said, at least in my mind. The ships themselves were used primarily for ferrying soldiers from place to place, although men could and did fight from the decks with projectile weapons and long spears, as seen on numerous pottery illustrations, like this cup from Eleusis, a small city near Attica. Uh, or it's in Attica, a small city near, near Athens. And also this seventh century crater or mixing bowl from Etruscan Cairo, which is now in the Capitoline Museum. You can see from this eighth century depiction of a galley that the ships were long and narrow and required numerous oarsmen to propel them. From names that survive in literature, we know that the favorite ones, at least among the Greeks, came in 20, 30, and 50 oar sizes. They all had limited room for cargo because the oarsmen took up so much space in the hull. And so these ships were poorly suited for carrying bulk cargoes like grain, wine, or oil. And John Hale explained to us that this, these kinds of goods were, were put in different kinds of ships, round ships, which were not uh, long and narrow and propelled by so many oarsmen, but driven by sails. Long ships, or these galleys, were better suited for fetching, fetching luxury items like metals, precious woods, ivory, or finished goods like bronze cauldrons and jewelry, where your crew could serve as a security force to keep the cargo safe. They worked equally well when you and your crew decided to rip off what you wanted to get rather than trade for it and turn to raiding, not trading. Around 700 BC, we think we detect an important structural change from this Assyrian relief found in Sennacherib's palace at ancient Nineveh and now in the British Museum. The subject is the naval evacuation of King Luli from Tyre in the face of an Assyrian attack. The ship's forefoot or cut water, which you see there, has a collar on it. There's the collar and there's a drawing of what the collar is like. And so it appears to be sheathed in metal, presumably to protect that long, narrow forefoot from damage when ships fought prow to prow and bumped into one another. You can see what was involved here from this famous fragment of a wall painting showing an Assyrian river warship engaged in combat with a now missing enemy vessel. Do you see what's going on here? Here we are at the bow of this ship. We have a forefoot, which would extend out here and terminate in the point that we saw before in the other relief. There's a man sitting on the forefoot. He is holding on to a rope that is attached somehow to something in front of him. But above him, there is a man, a soldier, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Do you see that? He's got his arm out here. He's grabbing the forearm of another combatant. There is a struggle going on here. And that man, presumably, is pulling on another man who is standing on board another vessel, which is either sideways to this attacking vessel here, or prow to prow in a position opposed to it. In other words, these slender projections at the bow are not yet true rams. At least they're not shown in ramming maneuvers here. That is, not weapons built to deliver purposeful offensive strokes. Many scholars now believe that true rams do not appear until roughly 540 BC, when Herodotus describes the earliest naval battle in which rams are mentioned. Now, he doesn't actually say rams were used. The battle involves the Phocians. Well, he does, but you'll have to get this for yourself. It involved the Phocians, and you can see the city of Phocis here. Greeks from Asia Minor, who established a colony on Corsica, located there, at a place called Alalia, when the Persian takeover of Greek cities drove them from their homes some seven years earlier over here. 
From this new settlement on uh, Corsica, they made pirate raids on their neighbors, the Etruscans and the Carthaginians, and the territories they controlled. And the Etruscans and Carthaginians peeved, joined together to drive the Greeks from the area. In a sea battle fought off Alalia, the Phocian ships were outnumbered 60 to 120, but they still won, in a manner of speaking. Herodotus doesn't tell us how, but we suspect their galleys were all of the same type, so they performed well in squadrons, and by working together, they were able to more effectively conduct, conduct ramming strikes. Now, this is all hypothetical. The fact that they won by ramming is suggested by Herodotus's comment that although they won, they lost 40 ships, and the 20 that remained were virtually useless because their rams had been bent back. And it's hard to imagine how their rams were bent back unless they were used in purposeful ramming strikes. A decade or two following this battle off Corsica, we hear of the first large trireme navy, which was built by the Persian king Cambyses and used for his successful attack on Egypt in 525 BC. And you see the only uh, image uh, associated with Cambyses that I could find on the internet, which is a dubious seal impression. I'm not certain that it really does exist, but it appears in a Russian's book that I can't read in the original, so I can't verify this. Uh, theoretically, it is the seal impression showing King Cambyses gaining control over the pharaoh Psamtik of Egypt, uh, referring to uh, an event that Herodotus dates to the year 525 BC. If roughly similar to triremes built by the Greeks, and that's a big if, they carried a crew four times larger than the old galleys and were rowed by as many as 85 men aside who sat in three different levels in repeatable triads down <coughs> each side of the ship. Their job was to provide the propulsion that made the ship into a floating missile. And you've seen this before. This is uh, Olympias, and there is the grouping of three, or the triad. There's another one there, another one there, and there's a triad there. You can pick out the next triad behind, and so forth down the side of the vessel. The key to this missile's warhead was its ram. And it can be deduced from this weapon, from a slightly larger ship than a three, which was found in Atli Bay, south of Haifa, off the coast of Israel in 1980. The Atli ram, as it's called, weighs 1,028 pounds, is made of a very high quality bronze, nine parts copper to one part tin, and preserves inside its hollow casting a web of 16 timbers that once connected the ship's bottom to the warhead. The ramming timber, which is there, set at the junction between both waterline whales, the bottom planks of the hull, and the keel was a critical element that helped transfer the shock of the ramming collision to the ship's bottom timbers, where the forces were safely absorbed. Although trireme rams were similar, they worked on these exact same principles. There's a waterline whale. If we go above and look down on the whole construction, there is the port whale, there is the starboard whale. They come together like this, and where they meet, right at the, at the head, is pinched in between them this ramming timber that touches both the whales and touches the keel and touches the bottom timbers of the vessel. And so therefore, when you hit the whole construction, the forces are channeled down into the bottom timbers of the vessel. It'd be like uh, the forces that are generated on the head of a hammer, that the, the hammer derives its strength from the fact that you can get an incredible amount of, of a force generated from the, the hammer and the, the, the hammer will only work if the, a handle is able to, to, to absorb the, the impact of the, of the blow that uh, the hammer encounters. Herodotus, unfortunately, includes no description of Cambyses' trireme fleet in action. But despite this fact, the fleet was a real game changer. 
The new vessels were too big and complex, and thus too expensive to serve as private merchant galleys. So henceforth, only states with regular revenues could afford them. Private individuals would not build them, except in very unique instances. We do know of a few private individuals who apparently had triremes, but not many did. Furthermore, these new trireme fleets were comprised of ships built to the same specifications, that sailed at the same speeds, turned in the same predictable radii, and they also had interchangeable parts, so that the oars, the masts, the sails, the boat poles, the boarding planks, and awnings from one ship fit equally well on any other ship in the fleet. In sum, they were much more deadly than the fleets comprised of 50 oared galleys. And for that reason, after Cambyses <coughs> died, the old ad hoc system of warships was dead. And by the time of his successor, Xerxes, actually there was a king in between, uh, Xerxes' invasion in 480 BC, all of the major Greek <coughs> cities had switched to triremes, despite the increased costs and the fact that each individual state now had to find ways to pay for the ships, to pay for their maintenance, and to pay for the crews that sat and rode them. For example, the Athenians made a conscious decision. They elected to build a large trireme fleet three years before Xerxes set out from Asia, as John told us. And in the years that followed, they learned the skills that made their ships into weapons that accelerated quickly, turned smartly, worked well in squadrons of 10 and 20, and delivered disabling strikes to their enemies' sides and sterns. While the Athenians mastered trireme warfare, other Greeks still fought, as Thucydides tells us, old style, where their ships served as floating platforms for infantrymen and archers to have a go at one another. In the hands of an Athenian crew, however, and I apologize for the lightness of this image, the entire vessel became the weapon, with helmsmen and oar crew working together to outmaneuver their enemies and strike them at their sides. And some of the questions earlier touched on these points about how the crew and the officers of the crew had to work together and in unison to enable the ship to act as a weapon itself. Thucydides repeats what one expert commander by the name of Formio told his men before a battle at the entrance to the Corinthian Gulf during the early years of the Peloponnesian War with Sparta. Here's what he said. In a contest between a number of clumsily managed vessels, and he had in mind the Peloponnesian vessels, and a small, fast, well-handled squadron, and he had in mind his own Athenian squadron, lack of sea room is an undoubted disadvantage double negative. You want to have lots of sea room because as a fast moving squadron you're going to need it to maneuver. One cannot run down an enemy properly without having a sight of him a good way off. Nor can one retire at need when pressed. One can neither break through the enemy's line nor turn smartly to attack his stern, the proper tactics for a fast sailing ship. But the naval action necessarily becomes a land one in which numbers must decide the matter. So my advice to you, men, is to stay at your posts, keep quiet, and be sharp at catching the word of command. Remember, silence is an important quality in naval engagements, which hints again at the communication that has to occur. Now, at the time this was written, the price tag for such a fleet was considerable. If it took 57 pounds of silver to build the ship, it took an equal amount each month to crew it and a further 57 pounds every year or two for repairs. The Athenians built more than 200 ships. At one point, they had close to 400 ships in their fleet. There was more. Light wooden ships were extremely susceptible to a wood-eating mollusk called Torito navalis, which rendered the hulls unseaworthy in a single season without proper care. You can see a piece of wood here that is riddled with this worm that eats down into it. There's a, a schematic picture on the right which shows you what the thing looks like. For this reason, as we've heard already, the Athenians stored their warships in covered slipways with stone walls and tile roofs supported on columns. Hundreds of these ship houses were built in the three war harbors of Athens, located in Piraeus, the city's port town. Here the Athenians had their naval yards as well, their construction and maintenance facilities, their warehouses for ships' gear, 
and the accountants who kept track of everything, as we know from a series of inventory lists. These documents, which were discovered by chance, were published on stone each year and listed in precise detail the ship's gear owned by the state, the captains and triremes to who the gear was given, what condition everything is, it tells us which or were, sorry, which oars were worm-eaten, and whether or not the captains or their heirs, if a captain died in battle and lost ship equipment, the heir was still responsible for paying it back to the state, and all of the records were kept and published on these lists. We don't have all of them, unfortunately. Uh, they were inscribed on both sides of a big slab, and when they were reused later in the Byzantine period or late Roman period, the backside of the slab was erased so that it could be turned into a water channel. So the part that has the writing on it was put down into the ground, and the erased side was up with channels cut into it. So we have lost at least half by the fact that it was reused. But thank goodness they were reused, because otherwise we wouldn't have them at all. Following the defeat of Athens by Sparta in 404 BC, at the end of the 5th century, Warships increased further in size and complexity, but in regions away from Greece. In the course of the next century and a half, the largest ships carried more than 1,000 men with wide decks for holding catapults, assault towers, boarding bridges, and other kinds of siege machinery. These vessels were called big ships by the ancients, while modern scholars prefer a term that's invented in late antiquity, polyremes or polyaries. Polyremes, which refers to their oar systems, which were oars driven by multiple men. As you might expect, these heavier warships developed incrementally. We first encounter fours and fives at the turn of the fourth century in Sicily, 400, 399, 398. Fours, we think, had four men in each rowing unit, most likely with two men to an oar at two different levels like the middle alternative that you see there. The first fives were probably rowed with a configuration of two men on the uppermost seat, two men in the middle, and one on the bottom, while sixes, which appeared during Alexander's lifetime, may have been rowed with a configuration of two, two, and two, or by three and three. What you see uh, in this diagram is two, two, and two. Three and three. The last configuration, with three men set at two different levels, deserves a comment. If we may judge from later periods of history, placing three men per oar forced the oarsmen to stand to complete their stroke, and even climb steps to put the oar blade into the water. While more men per oar meant increasing the ship's beam, adding to its weight and reducing its speed and maneuverability, it also meant an increase in ramming power, deck space, and carrying capacity. Here's an image of what one of these larger galleys looked like. Although the scale is skewed to emphasize the deck soldiers, you can see that the oars are large in size and the deck is wide enough to carry a tower at the bow fitted with emplacements for small catapults. That would be those things right there and there. What look like shingles on the surface of the tower are probably just that. They are probably iron shingles to ward off fire arrows. Uh, the tower itself would have been built out of a light skeletal uh, construction of wood, and you would put shingles like that, either of leather or, or of iron, over it to keep it from uh, being set on fire. Alexander the Great proved how useful these characteristics could be when he attacked the offshore island of Tyre, a city on the island, in 332 BC. By mounting catapults and other siege machinery on the decks of his threes, fours, and fives, some of which he even yoked together to provide wider platforms, Alexander took what would have been a two-year-long siege at least, and he completed it in just seven months, that is roughly one quarter of the time. Following Alexander's death in 323, these polyremes became even larger, particularly under the direction of a guy named Demetrius the city besieger, who was the son of Antigonus I, one of Alexander the Great's generals. 
We can see from a battle that Demetrius fought off Cyprus in 306 that he used his big ships like the front line of an American football team. He lined them up about 600 yards from the enemy, who was lined up in a similar manner, in line abreast formation, and then proceeded to crash head first into the warship bows opposite him on the line. It was a giant game of chicken. While the lines approached one another, the helmsmen tracked the gaps between ships to their right and left. Too much space meant that they were vulnerable to oar attacks from the enemy ships. Too little space meant that they might foul the oars of their own neighboring ships. They also tracked the gaps between the enemy ships in the opposite line and planned where to land their own ramming blow, either on the enemy's ram or its epotides which are shown here. And in some ships, the apotis, or the, that's a singular, the apotis is the forward end of the oar box, or in this, in this case, the outrigger on which the upper row of oarsmen sat. And then, just before impact, the deck personnel crouched down, tensed their muscles, and held on for dear life. Collisions, we learned from a number of sources, were loud and terrifying and if you were unprepared, could easily knock you off your feet, or worse yet, knock you overboard. At times, we're told, men were ejected into the sea from deck towers by the force of the blow of ram hitting upon ram. Then, once the dust had settled and your senses cleared, the foredeck man that John Hale told us about quickly assessed the damage and signaled back to the helm to either back water or prepare for another strike or to alert the Marines to defend against the boarding party because the enemy you had struck was fatally damaged, was taking on water, and the only way it could survive would be by boarding your vessel and throwing you overboard. In the Eastern Mediterranean, the largest of these big ships were used for attacking coastal cities with catapults and siege machinery, and for literally barging their way through the barriers strung across harbor entrances, which were sometimes floating pontoon barriers connected together by chains, and sometimes were just chains. Only the wealthiest of the states following Alexander could afford these biggest ships, which increased in size from eights, nines, and tens, up through a 13, 15, 16, then we hear of a 20, then we hear of two 30s, and then we hear of a 40. The 40, which was built by the fourth Ptolemy of Egypt, was so big that it made it into a Ripley's, believe it or not. And as a result, its dimensions were recorded. Uh, and we can read them today, and it's difficult for us to, to comprehend them. Um, what you see here comes from an author by the name of Athenaeus. And in it, he says uh, that the length was more than a football field and a third, that the draft was surprisingly shallow, as you would expect. The oarsman, this is what gets most people, was powered by 4,000 men, and that the entire crew, 7,250, uh, again, I've, I've looked all over the internet for the, the numbers. I don't think we have a ship in our fleet with more than 6,000 men on board. So, 7,250 men is more than occupy a modern-day large-class aircraft carrier. Now, you ask the question, did it work really very well? And the answer is no. It didn't work very well at all. We're told uh, by one author that it was dangerous to take it out, and dangerous to maneuver, and dangerous to take it back. But I am struck by the fact that there were two 30s that were built, presumably on a similar model. And the two 30s, there was one that was constructed. The architect was praised so highly by the person who built it that a statue was put up to him on Cyprus. He was given honorary citizenship at a place called Paleopathos. And then, presumably, by the time of, of, of uh, uh, the, the ruler's death, um, Ptolemy II, uh, he built a second 30. So they must have worked. They must not have been like the 40, which were just sort of for show and for um, political statements. We have no images of ships this large, or for that matter, of ships like the 8s, the 9s, or the 10s that were actually used in naval battles that we have descriptions of. But we can get a sense of their relative sizes and their firepower if we look at their warheads. And this is where I would 
really love to have some help from some, some mechanical engineers. In 31 BC, the future Emperor Augustus defeated the fleet of Mark Antony and Cleopatra at Actium, famous Battle of Actium. And a year or two later, he built a massive victory monument to commemorate the event on the site where he pitched his tent when he planned the battle. In the facade of the monument, he displayed 36 warship rams, which you see right there. And the facade of the monument is a big retaining wall that holds up the side of the terrace on which his tent had been pitched. 36 warship rams, which, if he is following the, the practice of most Greeks and Romans, rep should represent a tithe, or a one-tenth dedication of the 360 warships that he captured from his enemies, Cleopatra and Antony. The largest he displayed here, and I think they were from tens, I don't think, they could be from nines, but we're told that the largest ships in Antony's fleet were tens, and I think the smallest were from fours or fives. Except for one large, uh, one six kilo fragment, which you see me here holding, the rams are long gone, but the sockets or the holes remain that once received the weapons, countersunk into the face of the stone to a depth of about 50 centimeters. Using 3D scanning technology, we have reverse engineered the weapons from the contours of the sockets to give you an idea of their relative sizes, and they are huge. I show in this slide a front view of the 3D models we produced. How many of you in here have seen the movie uh, Dr. Strangelove? You know there's this scene at the end where Slim Pickens sits on the atomic bomb and rides it down? Okay. If you want to feel real power between your legs, okay, you can go sit on one of these warship ramps and pretend like you're sitting on the bow of the warship. If you were sitting on a three, it'd be a little uncomfortable. You'd be like that. If you were sitting on a four, it'd be about like that. If you were sitting on a five, it'd be about like that. If you were sitting on a six, I'm not sure that you could easily get your legs around a six. The 10, which is up here, the best way that I can demonstrate to you its size is this. If I go up in front of that ram and touch its left side with my right hand and touch its right side with my left hand, I can't reach. It's that big. It is this big chunk of bronze that we determined that if you made it out of a, a real cast of bronze would weigh between four and five tons. It is a huge thing. Such was the warhead that was placed at the bow of Antony's largest ship. In the simplest terms, these rams suggest that the difference between tens and threes was so striking that a ten would literally crush a three if they ever hit prow to prow in the opening charges that began most naval battles of this period. The best thing that I could give you as an example would be to take a smart car and run it into a Budweiser truck full of uh, beer, an 18-wheeler, and see what the result would be. Uh, I think it's along those lines. Let's pause for a moment to consider the ram from the Roman trireme that I put back up here. I didn't make much out of it, but I think we may have an example at least of a Roman trireme ram there. Um, it's just my opinion. And it's one that, as John said, so much of what we say is conjecture based upon suppositions, based upon hypotheses, based upon, well, you get my point. Um, if, let's see. Um, I guess I've got to go back to there, right? This Roman ram is one of 11 that have been found so far, all roughly the same size that were found on the seafloor in all roughly the same place, which is right about there. Off the western coast of Sicily, there, between Carthage and the western coast of Sicily are these little islands. This is the northwestern corner of Sicily. There's the town, Tropani. There's the battle site there. I can go back here. How did that occur? There we go. I 
keep losing my place here. Um, they went to the seafloor among the debris of the last battle of the first Punic War that was fought between Rome and Carthage in uh, 241 BC. Everything at this site went to the bottom on March 10th, 241 BC. Now, most people think the Romans and Carthaginians fought this battle with fives, quinquiremes, because this is what Polybius, the best historian to chronicle the battle, tells us. The battle debris, however, tells a different story. You see here a selection of artifacts found up to 2013, which include battle-scarred rams, helmets, and shipping containers called amphoras that once held badly needed relief supplies for an entire garrison stationed nearby on Sicily, just behind that town, Tropani, that I showed you a picture of. Aside from the helmets, which bring to mind vivid images of doomed men flailing around in the water, the most evocative items are these split and dented rams, which come from naval encounters who preci whose precise stories are lost to us. Although we're far from figuring out all the details, the battle debris marks some, that makes some things clear. It seems, for example, that Carthaginians were hurrying to deliver a shipment of supplies to their garrison on western Sicily that had been unexpectedly besieged by a Roman army. Caught off guard because they didn't expect the Romans to be in the area, they were forced to send a relief force quickly, and so they pressed into service some old warships they had captured from the Romans eight years earlier. I say this because many of the warships on the seafloor displayed Latin inscriptions. So this is a battle in which the Carthaginians lost so badly that they signed peace with Rome, and most of the rams on the seafloor have Latin inscriptions on them. When they approached western Sicily, the Punic ships, shown by the blue arrow, were intercepted by a Roman fleet, shown by a red arrow, off the Agate Islands. Um, the seas were rough that day, and the Romans met their enemies, at least in this portion of the battle zone, where we found the weapons, with a squadron, I believe, of heavier galleys that literally crushed their opponents, who were on threes. Although I've used evidence from different periods, I suspect the difference in size between the weapons was enough, uh, was roughly what you see in this slide. The battered results lie on the seafloor and preserve eloquent evidence for prow-to-prow -prow collisions between threes and larger classes like fives. Before I conclude, we need to return to the third and final stage of our investigation. If you remember, we wanted to understand why naval powers continued to build this class of triremes, not only after the big ships were first introduced, but also after the big ships were mothballed following Actium. What was it about triremes that was so appealing? By now, you've probably realized that not all triremes were built alike, and that their designs varied from place to place and from time to time. Despite this fact, there must have been something about these ships uh, that continued in their design throughout its long history to make the class so popular. And that, I suspect, was the three's ability to do things larger warships could do for a fraction of the cost of those larger warships. To address this issue, we might list all the sorts of things that ancient states asked their fleets to achieve. And when we do this, we see that threes performed most of these duties and thus served as all-purpose warships. This certainly explains to me their popularity and longevity as a class. It's now time for me to conclude by returning to our main topic, the influence of triremes on Mediterranean history. In a word, it was considerable. Just consider the following. At the start of the fifth century BC, Triremes saved a fledgling Athenian democracy from the eastern despotism of Persia. They also allowed the Athenians to create an empire, and then to milk it, to use Mahan's term, in ways that produced a culture whose intellectual and artistic accomplishments still amaze us. Triremes ferried Alexander's forces from Europe to Asia, and then secured the eastern Mediterranean while he completed the most successful military campaign of Western ancient history. In fact, they have served as transports and support ships throughout their long period of use. 
Then, following Alexander's death, triremes served alongside their much larger cousins in the harbor-busting fleets of the successor kings. They, along with fours and fives and larger ships, protected, sorry, they along with fours and fives then protected the larger and slower polyremes from attack when placed in the rest of the battle line or when moved from harbor to harbor or from region to region. They served alongside fives in Rome's wars with Carthage and with every other Mediterranean power, including pirate fleets, up through the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Among the Romans, their popularity was second only to fives, if we may judge from the frequency with which they are mentioned in our sources. And finally, after Augustus mothballed the big ships in Antony's fleet, he and his successor emperors relied primarily on threes to keep in contact with the corners of their empire and to discourage piracy. In closing, I'd like to leave you with something a little provocative to think about. John Bardalis suggested, I might say, that trireme technology saved democracy. Well, I've tried to say that a couple of times. Which is something that we could discuss, I think, but I don't really believe that it's that simple and I don't want to go there. Here's what I'm willing to tell you. I think, let me give you an odd analogy. If we were to compare ancient warships to modern trucks, which I grant you is a stretch, then the triremes of antiquity are the Ford F-Series pickup trucks of today. Now, if you don't know much about pickup trucks, I'll tell you a little. The Ford F-150 is the most popular truck in both America and Canada. F-Series trucks have been sold continuously since 1948 and have been the best-selling pickups for 43 years running. In Florida, where I live, they are owned by college professors, engineers, cattle ranchers, strawberry farmers, fishermen, landscapers, and yuppies. You can do a ton of stuff with one of these. And they are so affordable that almost a million are sold every year in the United States and Canada. Think about it. Thanks very much. should invite a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, any, any questions from the audience? Can I start, okay, can I start with one first? Uh, I'm fascinated with the rams and the metallurgy technology that's associated with them. What do we know about the casting? Because casting one of these things and controlling temperatures uh, so they don't break apart, they don't have, you know, what do we know about, especially the large ones? Um, well, the one that we know the most about is the athlete ram, because a number of studies have been done of the ram. And um, it seems to have been made in a manner similar to uh, statues. Uh, what is unique about it is the fact that statues seem to have been made up of pieces that were about 50 kilos maximum. And the athlete ram, which weighs 465 kilos, seems to have been made in one pour, all except for a triangular piece at the end of its tail. So um, what's unique about it is that a large mass of metal was heated up and kept at a, a reasonably um, a, a static temperature, I guess, over a long period of time, because the forward half of the ram shows signs of uh, being rather homogenous in its, its structure, crystalline structure. So um, what they do with the larger rams is the, the composition that we're getting for uh, many rams that come off the Egedy Islands and the chunk that comes from uh, the, the ram platform at Augustus's monument uh, tells us that the Romans put in as much as 5% lead in, in, the, in, the, in the melt, uh, which presumably allows them to lower the temperature a bit of the, of the melt uh, and gain control over it for a longer period of time. Uh, but quite frankly, we do not know the skill that the, the techniques that were utilized in, in being able to um, uh, heat up and keep uh, molten for a long enough period of time the large amounts of metal that went into these weapons and then degas them in such a way that they don't develop uh, stress fractures, fractures or uh, bubbles in, in the melt, in, the, in the, the, the structure of the cast so that when they're put you know, in battle, they fail under impact. Now, some of the rams that, um, I don't have them up here, but some of the rams that were found off 
Sicily show that there were structural defects. So certain things cracked off of them because it looked as if there was a bubble there. Uh, so um, but the, pro the problem is, is as in Athens, if you have publicly engaged companies that are providing rams for a warship on which citizens' lives depend in battle, if the ram of a particular company routinely fails, that company isn't going to get any more business. So their incentives for, um, in, for, for uh, um, tweaks to the designs of both the warship itself and the, and the bronze warhead that's put on the bow of it. Um, I wish I could answer more carefully. If, if you want to know more, there is um, an article written by a young man named Asaf Oran. He's an Israeli. And I'll send it to you. He goes through the step-by-step -step process by which the ram was cast. Well, one final thing before I pass the audience. The fins that are used for ramming, obviously they have uh, penetrating power, but they seem like radiators to me, too. That when a piece of metal is cooling, it offers a way of radiating heat off of, of a piece of metal as opposed to being a hard, solid chunk of metal. That's an interesting point. I wonder whether that still is the same when it's encased within a uh, foundry material and encased within the... I, I don't know whether it would be... It would radiate in the same way because it's surrounded by... Yeah an investment. Yeah. Yes. Well, as you know, uh, the Romans tried to attack the city of Syracuse in the third century BC with great in the 60th. And they were met with disastrous results. The ships were just so unsteady. Uh, and they were vulnerable to all sorts of defenses. Uh, was this a one-time event? to try to attack a city with uh, or or anything? Or was it fairly common? It was, it was fairly common. Uh, what the Romans are doing at this time is they're beginning to adopt the siege craft tech, uh, the, the siege besieging or the siege technology that was known among the Hellenistic East. Uh, manuals were written about this. One of them survives. That comes from this very same time period, a little bit before. Uh, and uh, what they did was... Um, similar to the sorts of things that Alexander the Great did. The Sambuca that they developed at that time is similar to a landing bridge that, that would have been utilized by Alexander. Slightly different, but, but still similar. Uh, fives and threes and fours are used for uh, besieging cities throughout the third century, the second and the second century, and even into the first century. Yes, yes, sir. Um, I have a question about the uh, board warships used to carry cargo. Uh, I don't know if you know the answer. Um, the Antikythera mechanism, which has been in the news quite a bit. So let me stop and ask if you're familiar with, um, uh, know something about the, sh uh, the, the current archaeology of the ship that um, it was found upon. Um, whether that, and here's the question. The question is um, whether you know whether that was uh, a road warship, uh, uh, sorry, road ship, which sounds like were used to carry high value cargo or a more standard um, sailing ship, which carried kind of low value cargo. Because I think the answer to that might help to determine whether this ancient computer was in fact a high value cargo or a lower value cargo. But I don't know if you would know the answer to the type of ship that was found upon. Um, I, I can only tell you what other people tell me. Uh, the Greek Archaeological Service, in conjunction with um, um, uh, a fellow from uh, MIT, has gone back to the site. And um, they believe that the ship on which it was, the ship on which this cargo was found was of much larger dimensions than was thought before. That it might be one of these giant kinds of grain carrier kinds of ships, meaning uh, a monstrous thing. And, and that will be uh, borne out by the results. Now, uh, these are the sorts of things you say when you're in an excavation because it helps you to raise money, uh, it helps you to keep enthusiasm high, and so I understand that, but, but I have spoken to them and they, they truly believe that this is a possibility given what the bottom configuration is like and where some of the artifacts are being found now. Um, it certainly was not an ore galley, 
a merchant galley or something like that. It, it was a large cargo carrying ship, and um, um, I think we'll just have to wait. If you, you can take a look at the National Geographic site, um, and I can send you a link to this. I, I'm blanking on the man's name. John, do you remember him? Who's, who's doing the Antikythera oh, excavation? He's a Texas A&M student, a George Bass student, um, but I can't think of his name right the, now. The, the reason is one of the questions was, is the Antikythera me mechanism computer a one-off, highly valued, or yeah. was this your typical, um, you know, fairly expensive astronomical gadget that you might find in any reasonably well-to-do household? And that, that is... I think, I think the answer to that is no. It's not that. And that's because, and this is just Bill Murray talking, it's because of the, um, the, the, the unique craftsmanship that goes into the construction of the, the gear teeth, which are not, it, it's something that cannot be mass produced. It is, it is obviously made by hand, but it, but it is, it is, the result of, how can I put it? It looks, it looks sort of like a prototype thing. Um, it, it doesn't look like anything that has been mass produced or, or would be produced in a factory on a particular model. This, this is a superior craftsman who has produced this particular thing. And, and I wish I knew more about it uh, to, to explain to you why, but I, I can't. James, maybe you can? No, that I can't, I can't answer, but I do have a question for you, apropos of the scale of these big ships at that point. Uh, I'm recollecting that Galileo, at the beginning of the uh, discourses on the two new sciences about strength of materials, set in the arsenal of Venice, and the discussants say, when I build a bigger ship, I need more scaffolding for it, because if I don't have more scaffolding, it's not, it's not directly proportional because of the ultimately because of the weight of the material. And I'm wondering how much uh, this, the sizes of these things is a function really of strength of materials, not, not to mention availability of materials. That you know, once you get up to that sort of scale, what you need to support a hull or whatever to build is so monumental that it becomes certainly practical. Is, is that part of this issue of getting, making bigger and bigger? It's certainly part of the issue of making it bigger and bigger. The, I think the standard accepted uh, rule of thumb is that I think clipper ships got to be something like 70 meters in length and beyond that you had to use steel reinforcing structures inside the vessel so that beyond 70 meters um, the wood itself could not support the mass that you were creating. This causes uh, people fits when they try to make a vessel that will be large enough to accommodate 7,250 crew members um, and might explain why the thing was considered to be so dangerous. It's resulted in a number of different hull configurations and I'm not sure any of them would, would work. Uh, but what you say is absolutely true. Once you get past a certain point, you, you reach a point at which the vessel itself will fail. John uh, Morrison has an interpretation of one of these ancient warships as being a hundred meters long. And that's what he gets from looking at the text. He sees the number of men which are in what they call a stoikos or a column, and he, he counts them up, uh, approximates so much space per man as he did in, in Olympias, and comes up with a hundred meters for the vessel. And um, many people believe because of what we learned with clipper ships that you just could not build an oar galley that would be 100 meters long that would not break apart. So um, it's a, an excellent observation that applies to all of these things. Can I just follow up though? Mm -hmm. Maybe to Larry or other speakers this morning address this, but where do all these trees come from? Yeah. Well, uh, we do know that certain kings um, had strategic timber preserves where no one else could harvest the trees from a particular area. There was a region in Cyprus that was known as uh, a, a, an excellent area for getting a particular kind of timber that was long and straight. There's a pupil of Aristotle by the name of Theophrastus who writes a treatise which is an inquiry into, into plants 
And in that, he talks about certain long stretches of wood that are clear of knots from, um, from Cyprus, such as are in the preserves of the Macedonian king, Demetrius, who used it for the mast for his 11 or 13, I forget. Um, we know that large amounts of timber are coming from southern Italy, the southern area of Italy. We think maybe one of the reasons the Athenians elected to um, uh, pursue their interests in Sicily at the time they did was because relations with Macedonia to the north, their normal supplier for timber for their fleet, had gone south, and the Macedonian king had rejected their uh, alliance. And so it, they're thinking in terms of where can we get this strategic resource. It's not only timber, but it's also forest products, it, a huge amount of tar, pine tar was utilized. And then we've got to think in terms of the grasses that were utilized for the, uh, the cordage and uh, where the, 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 the metal is coming from and the copper and iron and lead. And, and all. it's an excellent point. They, they, just as we, had to be concerned about where their, where their strategic reserves were, which is why the Ptolemies had so much trouble. The Ptolemies were very much interested in controlling the Levant up uh, through the Lebanese, uh, the, the, the Lebanon forests of uh, Phoenicia, because this is where they got uh, timber for their fleets, because Egypt, as you know, has no stands of timber. So it's an excellent question. It's why the Romans could build fleet after fleet after fleet after fleet. Yes? How long were the wars for those ships? I think. We did get a, a dimension, I don't know whether I had it on the slide, for the length of the ore of a 40. Uh, and I don't remember what it, what it is. Um, I'd be making up a number if I told you. The number like 57 sticks in my head, but uh, it, that'd be feet long. Um, we're told that the ores were so heavy that lead was put into the, um, uh, what is it called? Is it the loom, which is the... The handle, the handle, the handle loom, and then the blade. Okay, so in, in the handle, uh, that, that lead would be put into the handle, whether it was put as a collar around it, so that it would it would allow the men to lift the ore out of the water because it was so heavy. I think they would have been like old-style telephone poles and larger. They, they We know that in historical periods, they used secondary handles called battens that were through-bolted through the side of the, the ore. And um, I thought I had a picture in there, although I didn't see it during my presentation, of um, we've got some really nice drawings of three, four, or five men to an oar and how they had to stand up on a ladder to get the oar into the water and then literally launch themselves off of the ladder back to a bench to pull the oar up to their chest uh, to complete the stroke and then march forward again, climb up the ladder, and then fall back onto the bench. So the, the ores must have been very large and very heavy. And also would have required specialized wood. I mean, you can't just cut down any kind of tree and make a strong shaft of that length. That, I can't tell you about that for extra large ores, but we do know something about trireme ores. I think it's Theophrastus, or is it Andocides? One of these two authors informs us that um, Someone purchased a bunch of ores from Macedonia, and each ore, each spar, rough spar, was made of a single sapling, a single tree. Yes? Uh, to what extent can you describe something like the 40 as a warship? Is it just a floating march like the uh, ship at Maria? Um, can you imagine that? Did, were they ever used in warfare? Uh, the 40 was not used in warfare. I think we've got to conclude um, and maybe the 30 wasn't used in warfare, maybe the 20 wasn't used in warfare. The largest ship that we know that was used in warfare was something called an 8, which may have been a double 8, like a 16 with two hulls. Um, you can argue about the design of all of these ships. Uh, I think that they were um, floating, mobile, self-propelled siege platforms. That's what I think they were used for. And uh, we see them, them appearing after uh, Demetrius of uh, Demetrius, the city besieger, had this uh, fantastic year-long siege of the city of Rhodes that was unsuccessful. 
And uh, when it was concluded, then we get some of these extra large warships that are being constructed. I think they're constructed because you put large siege towers on the, the expansive deck. Can we just leave it to one more question and then we'll wrap up because it's getting late. Alex? I guess, um, Louder. I guess that uh, question would be to look at it as the persistence of the ancien trairie, if we can explain Arnaud Mayer. Um, what's the last trireme? Does it go up into the 19th century no. the Ottomans, or is it and uh, if, so, if it dies out before, then why? You know, the, the, the Venetians call their galleys triremes. Uh, so the name does continue, but the design of a, sort of a, a, a continuous ancient line of descent seems to go at least up to the beginning of the 5th century. Uh, there is an author by the name of Zosimus who writes that... Um, Triremes now have not for a long time been built. And he's writing in the 5th century. What, what, what is the, what's the changeover? I mean, they continue to use galley ships. What, what replaces it technologically? Well, after that, there is a kind of ship which is called a runner. In Greek, they call it a dromon. And uh, throughout the, it's a smaller ship, not as large as the trireme and probably not, it does not have as complex an orage as the trireme does. But to be honest with you, in late antiquity, authors used the term trireme synonymously with warship. And since they do that, sometimes it's difficult to understand whether they're just using it to mean a warship or whether they actually have in mind something that might bear a resemblance to the trireme that John Hale was talking to us about. And we just don't know. But Zosimus's comment is, is evocative of the fact that there was this tradition that somehow sitting men at three different levels in a particular way. Once again, I come back to my truck metaphor. Um, I think these designs change drastically over time, just as those truck models change over time. But I think what remains steady is a particular set of strategic objectives that a sort of middle level big warship will produce for you. And when those strategic objectives are such that you know you, you have to build giant warships to complete them and you can't afford it, well the best thing that you can do is the trireme. And if, if you're a pirate king and you rely on a lot of little ships and you want a prestige vessel, well then the trireme is the biggest thing that you can get to afford. It's one of those sorts of things. Okay, uh, we'll wrap it up now because it's just about three o'clock. I want to thank Professor William for, for, for Murray for a lovely. Uh,